Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Sinead DeFries and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Mark Ellis. Hey, what's up everybody? My name is merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Collider Movie Talk, the best show in the entire galaxy regardless of what the topic is. Now, our primary goal here today is to talk movie news and to bring it to you guys. So we have good stuff like Deadpool 2 information. We got a Doug Lyman upcoming feature, but our tertiary goal here, and I think we can all agree on this, is we need to buy about a minute for Sinead to go relieve herself. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. It's all right. It'll make the show more exciting. Also, here is Perry Nemiroff. Uh, the glare from that big metal thing over there. Turn it down. Put it down. Come on. Uh, oh, Woo! boy. Oh, yeah, please. yeah, it's John Roca. Yes! Look at this, Look, Shh. newly minted. Oh, it's so sweet, it's so pretty. It's so pretty, it is. Tag Team Champion, Schmodowns. I told you I was gonna do it. There it is, a title around my waist, I got one more to go. Mark, you know what I'm talking about. I'm surprised you own a belt. I thought people your age usually use suspenders. Shut but your either mouth. way, we are gonna go to our very first topic here on Movie Talk, which is? According to a report from Mashable, John Wick co-director David Leach is the front runner to direct Deadpool 2. Mashable notes that several other directors remain in the mix, but that Leach's name is at the very top. The sequel doesn't currently have a release date, but Fox is moving forward with casting already underway for the role of Domino. Mark, what do you think about John Wick's David Leach helming Deadpool 2? I wish I thought of that idea, Sinead, because earlier this week on Movie Talk, we were talking about, we kind of did like our fantasy draft as to who we think should be helming Deadpool 2 now that Tim Miller is out. Nobody picked the director of John Wick, and one of us probably should, because there's been reports coming that even he is not only at the top of the list, that they might actually already be seeking him to have talks about directing Deadpool 2. And you look at what he was able to do in John Wick with all the action that they brought to the table. It's the same stylized violence that we'd like to see in a movie like Deadpool 2. And there's, a, there's notes of humor in John Wick. It's not as funny as what we would hope Deadpool 2 would be, but they're not going for that in John Wick either. There's some things, though, that made me really laugh at the first John Wick, and I think if they can transfer some of that sense of humor, amplify that, put in the same stylized violence, I love this call, if indeed comes out to be true. So I don't really care what you think, so let's go to <laughs> Perry Nemiroff. What do you think about this news? This new, I mean, the whole Deadpool <laughs> situation still makes me a little sad, just because look at what happened with Deadpool. It was something this mm -hmm. group of people that worked together for so many years fought for. They made it happen. They made it happen well, and they made a ton of money. I was so happy for them. to. So it's like I view them as a little movie-making family, and to see them be torn apart is a little disconcerting. Yeah. But, you know, the reasons are very understandable that he, he wanted a more stylized version, and Ryan Reynolds and co. wanted to stick to what they had done before, and I liked what they did before, so I think I'm fine with that. And in terms of Leach being the top choice to direct, I don't think there could be a better option. And it's easy to forget that he didn't just do John Wick. He's not a guy with just one title to his name. He also finished directing his second movie. Mm -hmm. He's been a stunt coordinator for however many years. Yeah. He also has done a ton of second unit work on big, big movies like uh, Jurassic World, uh, Dracula and Toll, tons of mm -hmm. stuff. So this is a really experienced guy here. And I think if they do wind up uh, locking him in, the movie could only be better off for it. All right, Sinead, what's our next story? <laughs> John, you know, what's interesting about this is that Leach has proven he's the guy who can not only make a kick-ass action movie, yeah. Yes. with a little bit of humor in there, yeah. but they did so on the cheap with John Wick. That yep. did not have a huge budget, but yep. it didn't notice the difference when I'm watching it. Yep. How about you? Do you think this is a good call? I think it's a great call, and I think it's a great move, too, because there was a bit of PR fallout from this, because everybody loved what Tim Miller had done with the original Deadpool and all the work he did possibly leaking the footage, which sparked the whole uh, the whole phenomenon to get it shot, to mm -hmm. get it made. And, I, and, and there was a little bit of backlash on Ryan Reynolds, pushing a little bit of his clout to get Tim Miller off the film so he could be more of the focus. Now, you bring in a director that's not as seasoned. Yes, he's done all these other things, second unit. He's done a couple of other films, absolutely. But he's a guy that you can still kind of manipulate or work with and kind of get to where you're going. So maybe they'll find what he had with Tim Miller with a little bit less of the drama because apparently that's the rumors coming out that they have butted heads a number of times through the production of the film. So you've got maybe a little smoother track for Ryan Reynolds. You're trying to appease your guy that you're paying, Warner Brothers paying so much money to. Why not go this route? And Leach is a great stunt coordinator. Look at that picture him I would give him a movie to direct absolutely <laughs> this guy looks so badass I would absolutely give him a movie to direct and I think John Wick was so fantastic one of my closet favorite films I think a lot of us feel that way so why wouldn't Deadpool 2 have that same kind of vibe still keep the humor like you said Ryan's there's no way Ryan's not going to do a film without that kind of humor but you're going to get the action even more on point than what we saw in the first Deadpool and here's what I like about David Leach as a potential director for this project too is that you mentioned his stunt coordinating background he was also a stunt performer before he started yeah. coordinating them how great is it to have a director be like I don't like the way you're 
doing that, then he can just get in front of camera <laughs> and actually do a stunt and then get back to directing. Maybe we'll see David Leach do so in Deadpool 2. Sinead, what's our next tale? While Robert Downey Jr. has his plate full with two more Avengers movies on his contract, he is still very much interested in getting his next Sherlock Holmes movie off of the ground. Variety reports that Warner Brothers and Team Downey have created a writer's room to help shape the script and story for the next installment. They include Guardians of the Galaxy writer Nicole Perlman, Baywatch's Justin Malin, Rogue One's Gary Whitta, Tomb Raider's G Geneva Dwarrett Robertson, and Snowden screenwriter Kieran Fitzgerald. Downey is attached to star with Jude Law, also expected to return. Guy Ritchie who directed the first two films is expected to return as well. Perry, your thoughts in a writer's room for Sherlock Holmes 3. I'm going to continue giving Roka a hard time today. I don't really care about <laughs> Sherlock Holmes oh. movies. I know. I, all right. What I'm is that kidding. all about? This, this has nothing to do with <laughs> the beef no with, with Transformers or Independence Day. Okay. I am not particularly into this franchise. It's not my favorite thing. However, I will 110% admit that these are still quality movies, mm -hmm. and people clearly want to see these movies. Not my favorite. I understand why a lot of other people like them, and I think Robert Downey Jr. is perfect in this role. The interesting thing to me with this story is obviously they're going to move forward with Sherlock Holmes 3, given how much the first two movies made. The weird thing here is the writer's room, yeah. because anytime we ever see a movie announce that they're filling a writer's room, that's normal business on TV. In film, it typically, or as of late, has meant that they're turning it into some sort of franchise or cinematic universe, which there's, there's no confirmation that that's what's happening here. For all I know, they could have just gotten this group of people, talented group of people together, and talented up-and-comers, too. There's a lot of names on this list that you should probably mark now because you're going to see them well beyond this project. But they could have just gotten this group together to, you know, for lack of better words, crack the case and figure out what the next adventure this franchise should go on. So. No. It, it's going to be curious to see it develop. I'm, I would not be surprised if after they figure out where they're going with Sherlock Holmes 3, news drop that, oh, and we have plans for 4 and 5 and a spinoff and whatnot because right. who can help themselves now? It's a great point, Perry, because it does seem like a lot of effort just to get what it, what looks like a glorified book club where we're just going to sit around, we're going to read some Sherlock Holmes stories and figure out what the best one is to put on the big screen. I love the names that are involved in this writer's yeah. room, though. The ones that really stand out to me are Nicole Perlman from Guardians mm -hmm. of the Galaxy and Gary Witta from Rogue One, amongst other things. If they all have this collective of ideas and they settle on a story they think would be perfect to tell for Sherlock Holmes, that's something I want to see. I would side with Perry that I don't really care about seeing another Sherlock Holmes movie. It's not anything that's going to get me out of bed in the morning, but I have enjoyed the first two. I thought Game of Shadows could have used a little more pop. It could have used a little more zest in there. It started to feel like it was by the numbers towards the end of it. You can inject some fresh energy into this. Not only is it going to attract me and Perry back to the movie theater, it's also going to get Robert Downey Jr., Jude Law, and potentially Guy Ritchie on board to do at least one more of these movies. Roca, yeah. you seem to have loved Sherlock Holmes. Absolutely. You grew up while Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was writing those books. Yeah. So do you think that we're going to get not one more Sherlock Holmes movie, but a bunch more? Oh yeah, I think so because there's not this kind of vibe like you have with Iron Man where people are like, who's going to replace Robert Downey Jr. He's getting too old to play Iron Man, right? You have that vibe, but you don't have that with Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes can go consistently as through the books into older age where you're doing, like we even saw that film uh, Mr. Holmes last year, I think a year or a year and a half ago with uh, Ian McKellen. Great, very believable. It was a very old film. Sherlock Holmes. It was. Yeah. So that's the thing. So Downey can age into the role, no problem. Them. There's no rush. Jude Law himself also very much can age into the role. And so it's it's good stuff that you've got going on here with their chemistry. I disagree with both of you. These two <laughs> films are fantastic. And the second one was even better than the first, Ooh, in my opinion, hot because take. the pop you got was Numi Rapace, who was fantastic coming off those uh, uh -huh. Girl with Dragon Tattoo films, which she was great in. It was a good storyline. And the action and the film that, that itself that was so well done that you, I don't understand why it's taken so long to get to a third one. So to me, I'm super on board. This idea of a writer's room, Perry, this great point you bring up, it feels very TV-ish, and it's a way of like studios to kind of cover the fact that they have multiple writers. Usually the stigma when you have multiple writers on a film is the film's going nowhere, and it can't figure out its direction. But this looks like they're trying to hone, like you said, franchise situation, and my thing is this, my belief, and I want to put this in the back of the mind, is they're going to resuscitate League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and they can put Sherlock Holmes into that. And that's how you mm. do your property Whoa. franchise. That's, that a bit, would be that's a big idea yeah. that might get me more into this series. Yeah, because they, they messed that up 
doing League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. There was a lot of problems with that, adding Tom Sawyer. All of it was a mistake in the film. But Alan Moore's comic yeah. is fantastic, and it's perfectly made for Robert Downey Jr. to jump in and be Sherlock Holmes and be the additional part of them and make it work on a film. I'm sure this writer's room is taking place like a Morton Steakhouse or Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. There's one more seat at that table. Maybe we could get John Roke involved because yeah. he's got some big ideas. He hit on something I think is very interesting, Perry. Do you think that Downey maybe is making a push to have more Sherlock Holmes movies because you can't be Iron Man forever, but you can be Sherlock Holmes for the better part of the next 30 years. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if the push would come from him. I, I don't know Robert Downey Jr. I don't know what his thought process is. Someone who's found so much success in the MCU, I imagine he might want to step back and do mm -hmm. other things other than another growing franchise cinematic universe. But I mean, for all I know, he's super passionate about this role and that's what he wants. But another idea that popped into my head about this writer room situation is that maybe they're just trying to, to keep it contained. Because you know what happens when uh, big studios pump out a big movie like this, they'll put a script out, script doesn't pan out, and then it's like, oh, we yeah. now we gotta hire so-and-so to come in and clean up their work. Right. If it's this writer's room, then you kind of keep it in-house and it avoids that problem. Yeah. yeah, and I think we can all agree, sometimes we do get spoiled as movie-going fans that we want a great Sherlock Holmes movie. Let's let's call the fact a fact, is it? Anytime you get to see Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law have that kind of chemistry on the big screen, I don't really care what the story is. They could be sitting in the Cialis tubs for two hours, and I'd be like, you know what, that's a really good movie with a lot of great dialogue so I think we'd be on board for a Sherlock Holmes 3 it's just nothing that came to the forefront of my mind yeah. and we humbly <laughs> apologize all right now it's time to move on to that portion of the show that we like to call buy or sell Sinead's going to give us a topic we hear the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it and then we will watch Perry and Roca have a war of words Hoo -ah. According to Deadline, Doug Lyman is looking to direct the upcoming sci-fi adventure novel, Unearthed. Unearthed is the first of a two-book series to be published next year by Disney's Hyperion. The novel is a young adult thriller described as Lara Croft meets Indiana Jones, set in deep space. The story is about Jules Addison and Amelia Radcliffe, who join forces in a tomb raiding race <coughs> on a newly discovered planet, <coughs> setting to unravel the secrets of an ancient, long-extinct civilization. A release date has not yet been set. Roca, do you buy or sell Doug Lyman? And directing Unearthed. Oh, I absolutely buy this. Uh, I love Doug Lyman to pieces. There's not a film of his that I've seen that I haven't somewhat enjoyed or thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, so this is a great choice. And coming off of Edge of Tomorrow, which is one of my... I mean, this film should have made so much more money than it does. People are still clamoring for a sequel to that film, even though it underperformed at the box office, because the quality of the film is so good. I think Doug Lyman has come so far from swingers and go to where he's trying to now move into more of the sci-fi stuff, more of the bigger projects. We see this with Born Identity. All this progression, which is very logical for him as a director, to get bigger and bigger projects. This is a great way for him to combine both the kind of indie feel he had at the beginning of his career and the bigger points of views that he has now with the films that he's doing. You get a young adult novel a lot of these have kind of fallen flat for me you know they're not the biggest Hunger Games kind of petered out uh, what is the whatever the one that they're running all the time the one with Kate Winslet all those <laughs> like they, yeah Divergent <laughs> right like those don't grab my interest but something that's going to be directed by Doug Lyman will bring even even Orson Scott Card's film uh, uh, Ender's Game wasn't that good having someone like Doug Lyman in charge I think gives makes me excited to see what he can do with this and make make me want to go to a young adult film and see what he can do in space and this idea of Laura Croft with Indiana Jones it's kind of. I wonder if it'll kind of undercut what we've got this uh, uh, this uh, reboot of of Tomb Raider coming out. It might kind of take some of the juice away from that as well. Yeah, it'd be weird if Tomb Raider and Indiana Jones both come out in 2018 and then 19, and <laughs> yeah, then this is the best movie of either one of those <laughs> franchises. It's interesting because the authors of this book actually were cool with selling the pre-publication rights because they were such big fans of Doug Lyman, yeah. which means that they're writing the material. They know that this is the right guy to bring it to the big screen. Obviously, you got me hooked with the premise. You tell me about two great adventures. You're in deep space. They have to join forces. Maybe they have what we're talking about with an Indiana Jones and Marion Ravenwood kind of mm -hmm. relationship yeah. where they're both going after the same thing. They reluctantly team up and maybe they fall in love. Maybe they just hang out and have a nice platonic, you know, quest where they're raiding tombs and uncovering ancient civilizations. It says everything that we want in a blockbuster, Perry. How about you? Yeah, I can't not buy this. Doug Lyman, that log line sounds great to me. Yeah. And for the record, Ender's Game was just underappreciated. That was probably one of the better YA book to film adaptations out there. Yeah, I, 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 I thought Ender's Game. I, was... are, are we adding another film to I, our gl our growing list of movies that we need to debate? Wow, I cannot agree with that. <laughs> I at told all. you guys this is what buyer sell is. You're crazy. Just, it was a wasted You're actors, crazy. wasted opportunities. Oh, it drove me nuts. Ben Kingsley was the only good part of that film, and uh, they had to wake Harrison Ford to do his scenes. Go home Come and on. watch Independence Day Resurgence. Why don't you? Yeah. Well, I, I, I bought it on Blu-ray <laughs> yesterday. I bought it on Blu-ray yesterday. Take the belt away from. No. 
No. He does not deserve it. The Perry, first, point you. Because Independence Day was Citizen Kane. Yeah, so get out of here. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> After all that fighting, and all that. actually, it is interesting that they're working on this too because you just named the new. Well, we got a new Indiana Jones movie. We got the Lara Croft movie, right. and then on top of that, this also sounds a little like Valerian too. So oh, yeah. I'm kind of curious to see how that does. It comes out, and it's like this crazy space movie, and right. then we get this after. It's like, what if that bombs and nobody's into it? I wonder if that'll hurt this. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward going to for this movie going into production, and now we have a movie that is just wrapped production. Tell us more, Mr. Freeze. Another highly anticipated superhero movie just wrapped production. The cast and crew of Taika Waititi's Thor Ragnarok finished filming yesterday in Australia with a post-rap celebration broadcast of fans around the world via Facebook Live. Waititi then let a little something slip. While he was introducing an actor who will be in the movie, the character name of Meek was clearly mentioned. The name should sound familiar to Marvel's comic book Faithful, as Meek was an alien who teamed with Hulk during the Planet Hulk storyline. It appears now that we'll be getting a lot more story points from the popular run. Mark, do you buy or sell all the new connections to Planet at Hulk and Thor Ragnarok. Oh, it's such a huge buy for me, Sinead, because this is everything that we want to see from Hulk in Planet Hulk, but the movie's not called Planet Hulk. There's just been this thing in the air, even since the Hulk appeared in The Avengers, we're all like, that's the best part of that movie. Mm -hmm. It's been a little hesitancy to give Hulk his own standalone movie because people aren't really sure what you do with it. So if you can take all the best story points of Planet Hulk, and we don't know how deep they're gonna get into that, this could possibly be them trying to set the movie up for a Planet Hulk standalone yeah. film, which I think a lot of us would be on board for. Yeah. But everything that we've seen from this production, now that they're wrapped, they can't really do anything about it. <laughs> seems like there's a lot of Hulk in here. So Thor's movie, he's the name on the poster. You're going to get a lot of Hulk in this. And I think that this story just confirms that even more so. Roka, yeah. what do you think? Absolutely buy this. This is so great because I love the fact that they're bringing Meek in. Meek is one of these kind of weird little villains with a complicated storyline where you're on his side, not on his side, then on his side and not on his side because he does all this stuff for his own personal benefit and sometimes he's fighting the good fight for his own people and sometimes he's fighting the fight against to destroy earth like he did with hulk and so this is a good way in my interest in this is going to be is it going to be cgi or is it going to be live action for his character right are we going to get some awesome uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, motion capture type stuff who is going to do the voice of meek how are they going to create this character to make it work because hulk and him have battles the whole time during planet hulk so it'll be fun to see what they do with this i'm just excited because you're right mark they're just kind of letting it go Marvel once again doing the smart thing. Hey, we know this property hasn't been good. Now that we're in, in charge of it, we're going to release it slowly but surely, get people to enjoy Hulk, get people to enjoy Mark Ruffalo. Now give him a good sidekick, which they established in that first Avengers with Thor, that camaraderie, that chemistry they had, and now give him a little more of a sense, like a push off into the ocean with his own boat. And I think you're right. The next film will be a Hulk standalone film with him in it. It looks to be a road trip movie with Thor and Hulk, yeah. and then maybe Meek adding in some elements there, Perry. This already has an impressive cast. Yeah. What do you think about? the addition of Meek. I, I'm going to buy it. I like the, I like the sound of it because I didn't know anything about the character. Mm -hmm. Actually, it would have been really funny if we were taping the little meeting we had when the story broke. It's, <laughs> it's like a four-letter name and just the way we were trying to pronounce that name. <laughs> Is it Meek? Is it Me Mike? A, a little embarrassing. Now I know it's Meek. I will never mispronounce it. But your description of the character does intrigue me a lot. And if you watch that video that they posted mm -hmm. online, I think it's like a 15-minute video of you know the behind the scenes stuff yeah. the guy that he points at and says is playing meek he almost looks like i think he was just wearing like a trench coat it's nothing that suggests wow. motion capture at all okay. but then again you know for all i know he had a long break and he you know wiped off all the dots or whatever right. he needs on his face for that but this video was also just a really great video i've mm -hmm. said this with a number of films because one of my favorite things because now we've just kind of cultivated this industry where i mean that's why shows like this exist because we need to feel part of this we are so freaking invested yeah. in mcu dceu star wars everything and every little bit actually means something. So the fact that Taika Waititi took the time to turn on his phone for 15 minutes and say, look at look at Crims Hem Hemsworth, look at look at the makeup on Tessa Thompson, right. look at this set. That is just so damn generous and nice. And it, it felt like I was there for 15 minutes. Yeah. And I might be reading too much into this, and I probably am, but it's like sometimes you see a movie and they wrap production and it feels like they're trying to sell you on something. Other times, it just seems like a group of people who were genuinely excited about the yeah. project that they just worked on. That's what I feel from Thor Ragnarok. Since we saw that footage at Comic-Con, which was more than we thought we would see, you had that hilarious short with Chris Hemsworth as Thor being locked out of Civil War. Yeah, that's that was great and then seeing this just another example we could be in for a real treat when this baby hits theaters next year november 3rd 2017 tickets are not on sale just yet what's our next story 
Benedict Cumberbatch has already confirmed that he will return for Avengers Infinity War. And now, thanks to an interview with Yahoo UK, he's hinting that Strange might just be the guy to help bring the Marvel superheroes back together after the events of Civil War. When asked if he was Team Iron Man or Team Cap, Cumberbatch said, I think he has to be Team Doctor Strange. His job title is Defender of the Fabric of Reality. I mean, he fights other dimensional threats that are beyond the perception of that very potent squabble. I'd like to think he's going to help them both rather than take sides. Roka, do you buy or sell Doctor Strange being the one to bring the Avengers back together? Oh, God, I couldn't buy this any more than I could. I would take everybody else's money and buy it, too. It's just so good. Just a great idea. Um, this is something that's really smart that Marvel does all the time. They set up these situations. How are you going to get out of these situations? The new kid on the block. Doctor Strange is the new kid on the block. He'll have more leeway. He's got an outsider's perspective. This is how it works. He's used to negotiating peace between inter-world dimensions. What's a couple of alpha males banging their chests. It's nothing to him. So it works. Plus, Cumberbatch is such a powerful presence. Just listening to Sinead read his quote, you can hear his voice, you know, saying it. the squabble. I'd like to think he's going to help them both. You know, he's doing all that kind of, the, he has that kind of power. And what we've seen already, and the buzz, the early buzz of Doctor Strange is people love the movie or enjoy the movie very much. Maybe not hit all the high notes that they were hoping for, but it certainly is a fantastic film. So it's going to be a good character to come in and kind of negotiate the peace. And if you read the comics about Stephen Strange and Doctor Strange, you know that all the superheroes have a reverence for him that are not, that is does not exist for just about any other character in the Marvel Universe. So logically, they're going to give in. He's going to show them better ways to be. And just like any fight, the person on the outside who has no nothing invested is the better person to negotiate the peace. And I think it's just a smart move to give it to the new kid on a block, to give him even more to establish himself as a character in our eyes as a viewing audience. Perry, are you buying this as much as Roka is? I'm definitely going to buy it. And having seen Doctor Strange, our non-spoiler review is up. I'm not going to share any spoilers here, obviously. But this, this movie is a pure character piece. It's a character introduction, nice. and he goes on this great arc that lands him right in this position to be a guy that I would believe to be the middleman between mm. these two teams. And it just seems like a very natural progression for the MCU. It's like, obviously, we're going to hit that point where we need Team Iron Man and Team Cap to settle their differences and move on with their lives. And that could possibly feel forced given the weight of everything they went through in Civil War. And I think that if Doctor Strange is kind of the middleman and facilitating that, I think it could work really well. As someone who has not seen Doctor Strange for another couple hours anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing it today and uh, I'll do an emoji right afterwards on Instagram. I haven't done that in a while. Also, I haven't seen a cool Marvel movie in a little bit, so I'm very excited about my screening today and even more so about the future of the MCU because Doctor Strange, as an addition in there, I think he's going to be great. Do I buy whether he is the one that reunites Team Cap and Team Iron Man? Sure. Well, look, the, the thing that's going to reunite them is going to be an intergalactic yes. threat. Mm -hmm. That yes. is what is going to unite them. I am sure that Doctor Strange might play a role in that. I'm also sure he's not going to be the therapist for Tony Stark and mm -hmm. Steve Rogers. This is not a marriage counselor. This is going to be a situation that requires attention immediately. When Thanos comes calling and he's looking for Infinity Stones, that's when those two are going to realize they have to get back together. If Doctor Strange is the deliverer of that news or if he's there while it happens, then we can give him partial credit. But thank Thanos is the reason yeah. why they're going to be getting back together and fighting crime on an intergalactic scale. That's just my two cents. I could see the movie and be totally wrong, but uh, man, I'm excited about seeing Doctor <laughs> Strange today. That's going to be really cool. All right, Sinead, let's talk about puppies. According to an interview in GQ via the playlist, Wes Anderson is already in production on his stop-motion animated movie that features the voices of Jeff Goldblum, Bob Balaban, Edward Norton, Bill Murray, and Brian Cranston. The story is set to center on the lives of dogs, though exactly how the story plays out remains a bit of a mystery. Confirming his work on the production, Anderson told GQ, I've got an animated movie I'm doing that's happening across the room from me right now, so I can see a long list of emails from people on the set whom I now need to address. <laughs> Perry, bye. Buy or sell a stop motion movie about the lives of dogs directed by Wes Anderson. That's the silliest question I've ever heard. Of course <laughs> I'd buy this. It's freaking dogs. I love it. I actually, one of my favorite Wes Anderson movies is uh, Moonrise Kingdom. And when mm. I did an interview with the kids for that, I think I spent most of my interview talking about the kitten in that movie. Because the young <laughs> actress, she got to keep the cat and... Naturally, I had to talk about that the entire time, but I will watch anything he directs. I like some of his movies more so than others. Fantastic Mr. Fox is one of my favorites. Yeah. So if he's doing that kind of movie with dogs, really there's no better combination. Yeah. 
I mean, I would have to buy this because I'm the guy that got excited when Bill Murray was voicing Garfield. So, yeah, he's voicing a dog in a Wes Anderson movie. I'm going to have to get a little jack for that. The cast looks great. I never saw the fantastic Mr. Fox, but I hear it's I hear it's oh, really good. It's, it's really so charming. Good. There's a lot that. of humor yeah. in there, too. So this is something I would look forward to personally, more so than a live action Wes Anderson movie, which sometimes those are hit or miss for me. But something like this, it sounds like it's right up my alley. How about you, Roka? Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited. As someone who has seen Fantastic Mr. Fox and owns it, the Criterion Collection. I'm a massive fan of this film. A massive fan of everything Wes does. Just about everything except Darjeeling Limited. That's the one that did not connect with me. Or Bottle Rocket. I did not like either of those two. Mm -hmm. But everything else he's huh. done, I'm massive fans of. And Fantastic Mr. Fox was such a great take on what is stop motion animation. And the amount, you know, Johnny, uh, uh, Tim Burton makes such a huge deal of stop motion animation. Wes just did it. And it was brilliant and, and had his sensibility. So if you're going to bring those sensibilities to a dog world, especially with all this great, by the way, shout out to Ed Norton finding his role again in Wes Anderson universe because mm -hmm. he'd kind of been drifting outside figuring out what to do next and he hasn't been kind of breaking through and he show up in these weird films but his work in the Wes Anderson stuff especially Moonrise Kingdom is just so powerful and moving and good and takes advantage of him as a human actor and I love that and so to see him being one of the voices here is great and of course Bill Murray if you watch Fantastic Mr. Mm -hmm. Fox he almost steals the movie in every scene he's in uh, and so this is great stuff and I couldn't be happier about it and the fact that he's going back to the stop motion stuff to give it a little more, uh, little to expand that universe just a little bit more and see what his sensibilities are years later after having done Fantastic Mr. Fox. It'll be interesting to see what he does with it. All that. right, so I'm throwing you guys a, uh, a Cranston, a Goldblum, a mm -hmm. Balaban, a Norton, a Bill Murray. Which Do you think any of them are going to be voicing humans in this film, or do you think they're all going to be dogs? It's I guess it's impossible to say until we know exactly what yeah. the movie is That's about. That's why we're speculating now, Perry. I, okay, in my dream world, they're all dogs. Yeah. This is a movie about dogs in a dog world, yeah. and that is it. It's basically like the better version of Secret Life of Pets, which, yeah. I, which I did enjoy, mm -hmm. but this is kind of the movie that I would have preferred right. that to be. After yeah. seeing Bill Murray and how he crushed it as Baloo, I, I think that I'd like to see Bill Murray as a dog here, yeah. and Jeff Goldblum is the one that I'm really intrigued to see yeah. what a Jeff Goldblum voice dog looks like. <laughs> yeah, 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 I yeah, would probably yeah. adopt that dog. Uh, 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 rough. <laughs> rough. Is that, is rough, that, rough. Is that a rough? Is that a rough? <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to remind you guys that later on today, we have the movie trivia schmodown. Hey. It is back, and we have two new competitors in the singles competition. That would be Sasha Pearl Raver is going up against Kara Warner. That is going to drop right here on Collider Video at 2 p.m. Pacific Coast time, so make sure you guys check that out. And then also this weekend, we're going to have Collider Mailbags that are going to be dropping in the morning on both Saturday and Sunday. And of course, subscribe right here for all the breaking news that we're going to be reporting on throughout the day and indeed the weekend. Also this weekend, Stan Lee's Los Angeles Comic Con, formerly Kamikaze, now known as Comic Con, is back. It's going to be bigger than ever, and we're going to be a huge part of it. We hope so. On Saturday, <laughs> make sure you guys go to John Schnepp's Heroes panel. The Collider Heroes panel is going to be taking place, I believe, at 1 1 30 at 1 p.m. It's going to be at 1 p.m. Uh, let's get that room in th room 304 ABC. And then we have the Schmodown panel it is going to be at 5 p.m. on Saturday. That's going to be in room 306 AB. We are going to have two fans. They get to actually compete against a favorite Schmodown competitor. If you want to be one of the fans, all you have to do is you're going to look for Ace or Cops. Or they're two guys that work on the Schmoes No Live show. We'll tweet out a picture of them from the Schmoes No account. Find them and ask them to ask you a trivia question. You find them during the day and you're one of the first to do so and you get the trivia question right, you're going to get more instructions from there. But we can't wait to have two fans duke it out in a round one style match and then the winner of that is going to be playing somebody from the Schmodown. Will it be the outlaw over here? Will it be me right here? You guys are going to have to wait and find out tomorrow. Then obviously the Schmoes No panel is going to be Sunday at 2 p.m. All right, well, coming up later on on this very show, we're going to be taking your live Twitter questions. So go ahead, start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. And in the meantime, before we get to Mailbag, it is time for some box office predictions. Let's do it. And I want to get everybody in here. Before we go over to Wendy and Sinead, I'm going to let John Roca kick off. Your okay. box office predictions. Here's how we do it. The top five of this weekend are going to be, and we need your number for the number one movie. Wow. Okay, well, here's the deal. I think... 
<laughs> Unfortunately, number one will be Inferno, which looks terrible from every trailer I've seen. But we'll see how it does. I think it's going to be number one still because Tom Hanks is a major draw. This is the third film in this franchise. I don't know how he keeps going. It's amazing to me. Uh, I think Jack Reacher will be number two. It's still, it's got, it's actually getting good. And forty-four million is what they're looking at for Jack. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is so incredible for Jack Reacher. Not a good because it's not a good movie. Not a good movie. Boo, a Medea Halloween, which I am actually hearing good things about, mm -hmm. and I might actually go see this. Uh, I think is third. The Accountant, fourth, which was really good, and people, more people need to go see this Gavin O'Connor film. The Accountant was so good. I just saw it this past week over at the NoHo 7. So good, and Affleck does such great quiet work, and Anna Kendrick is fantastic as well. And Ouija, Origin of Evil, I think will round us out at number five. My shout out to Perry, because it's horror. I think Inferno is gonna be 24 million. How about that? 24 million sounds about right. Uh, for Inferno, uh, yeah, 24 million is a pretty good number. I'm gonna say 21 million dollars oh, okay. for Inferno. I, I don't hear a lot of buzz about it, but it is Tom Hanks opening the movie. We just saw Tom Hanks have a huge opening with Sully in That's September, true. so maybe we get something. And Inferno, it's, it, there's some scary elements. There's some horror elements to it. Maybe that plays well on Halloween. I got Inferno number one, 21 million. At number two, I'm gonna have Boo, uh, the Medea movie. At number three, I gotta give it to Jack Reacher, never going back, even though I'd love to bump Ouija up there because it is Halloween weekend. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it has quite enough. And at number five, I will top things off with the accountant. How about you, Perry? All right. Obviously, I'm going Inferno number one. And originally, I thought it was going to make close to 30 million. Mm. But then the Thursday numbers came in, and its Thursday number was a little low. Yeah. Oh, I see, think Perry I'm going to lean. Studying, studying I do. Numbers. I do. I love numbers. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to go with 23 million for Inferno. Oh, wow. All right. Cut number, broke his legs underneath. Yep, that dollar. yep. That's my style. Number two, Boo, a Medea Halloween. I think it's going to do well. I look at cinema score every once in a while. Mm. I do think that does, you know, it functions as somewhat of a sign of what could happen. People are and this film. Mm -hmm. It's got an A. Yeah. So I and like what you just said, good word of mouth. I wouldn't be surprised if that got, if that got more butts and seats for that. Hello. Number three, I'm going Jack Reacher. Then for four, I have the accountant beating out Ouija primarily mm. because it's going to be in more theaters. Yeah. So Inferno, Boo, Jack Reacher, The Accountant, Ouija. All right, she's Ooh. going against the game board, but it still comes in at the number five slot. Sinead DeVries, your top five for this weekend. All right, mine's almost very close to yours, Perry. But I have Inferno, then Boo, uh, <laughs> Jack Reacher. Yeah, boo. Then I have Ouija just because it's Halloween weekend, and I seriously think that people <laughs> might go do it. And then I have the accountant, which okay, Roka, so, you're right. Is so we have the same yeah. list. Yeah. So what's your number? We do number? have the same list. How much money do you think Inferno is going to make opening weekend? Um, I'm still gonna. I still think it's going to make close to thirty, but I'll say twenty-seven. Okay, it's twenty-seven to twenty-one Boom. for the, possibly the winning list. And now we get uh, Pikachu's involvement here. <laughs> Wendy Lee, what uh, <laughs> what do you think is in the top five this week? I have the identical list to you and Sinead. Oh, so boy. I have Inferno at number one, Boo at number two, Jack Reacher three, Ouija four, and Accountant at five. And I think I like your number. I like the twenty-seven for Inferno, mm. but safe, she's safe gonna, number. She's it's good. Right but one of I'm gonna go pessimistic, and I'm gonna go with twenty-two. Ooh. Oh, mm. she prices right at me. So 22, <laughs> by... 21. But actually, if, the, if Inferno makes $21 million or less and that list turns out to be right, that means Daddy takes the cake. <laughs> <That's> so <right. laughs> Wendy in the 22 to 25 pocket, and then Sinead, anything $26 million or above wins. And probably none of us will get it right because that's how it works here on Box Office <laughs> Predictions. Now we move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where you guys can email us anytime, collidervideo at gmail.com. Sometimes we get to it on Movie Talk. Sometimes we get to it on the aforementioned Mailbag, either Saturday or Sunday. Day, and we got two for you right now. What's up first in the mailbox, Sinead? Jonathan writes, greetings and salutations, Collider family. Now, I'm not one for talking during movies, but if you could sit down with your favorite filmmaker, ask questions, and record your own commentary with them on one of their films, who would it be and which film would you choose? I would love to sit down with Steven Spielberg and watch Jurassic Park or Saving Private Ryan, especially since he never makes commentaries. Would love to hear your picks. Perry, who are you taking for this one? I want to cozy up right next to him in that Triceratops in that picture. <laughs> I, I'm, he shouldn't I guess shoot I have animals to... like that. He should not shoot Dude. animals. Like that. That's not right. I don't like it. It's not a real guy. I don't to take I it really don't like that. <laughs> well, I'm going with Steven Spielberg for Jurassic Park just because that uh. is... It's one of my all-time favorite movies, and if I go that route, I could also say Wes Craven's for Scream. I could just talk about those movies all day long, but to throw in something a little random, 
I am just fascinated by the Fantastic Four meltdown. And oh. if if honesty was That's not good. was yeah. not an issue, yeah. and if Josh Trank had to be brutally honest with me and tell me all the information I want to know, I would love to sit. I want a tell-all book yeah. about that movie. I just want to know the true story. What if you could get? What if you could meet him at like 4 a.m. at a bar late at night in downtown? And he'd be like, I'll talk to you for two hours, but you can't record a thing. Would you still do it? I would still do it, yeah. yeah. I just want to know all the secrets. Really creepy Tinder to get, but uh, <laughs> hey, hey, I'm around four in the morning. Let's talk my bad movie. Movie Tinder. Uh, Roka, who you got? Uh, living, I would say Francis Ford Coppola to sit down with him and talk about the Godfather epic because I've been kind of addicted to it recently again. You kind of walk away from that film, for those films for a little bit, and then you come back to them. So I would like to talk to him about one and two. And it would also satiate my need to find out why three was so terrible, to sit there and talk with him be like, what were you thinking? Why were you caught up in this 90s malaise and created this kind of almost destroying your franchise with this film? A dead, I would say, Akira Kurosawa to sit with him and talk about Seven Samurai, the creation of it. I've read The Emperor and the Wolf, which is a 950-page book about his, all his movies, but the m most engrossing part of that book is his creation of Seven Samurai and how he came to it, and I would love to just sit down with him and listen to him, with an, obviously a translator, and have him just talk to me for a couple hours about how he created this, how he found Toshiro, how he cast all these great actors in that film. See, I would love to actually sit down with Francis Ford Coppola and watch uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula together <laughs> because I want to hear him gush about a movie and tell me about shots and stuff. Then every time Keanu Reeves comes on, I just want to hear him go, ah. Oh. <laughs> Somebody who is passed away is, I, I got to know, Stanley Kubrick and 2001 yeah. A Space Odyssey. Oh, that's I think great. that'd be so much fun to watch. As far as a comedic movie goes, I would love to have any of the Christopher Guest movies. I would probably mm. actually take Christopher Guest in a movie, but I would take Rob Reiner and uh, mm. This Is Spinal Tap because I'm so interested in the comedic notes of that movie, how much of it was scripted out, how much w direction was there, which scenes were totally ad lib, totally improv. I got to know that kind of stuff because that movie is so damn funny. I want to know how it all came together. Mm. All right, what's our next question? David writes, Trick or Treat Collider Crew, with it being Halloween time, if you could be any character or creature for Halloween with the resources of an effects company, who or what would you go as? Man, that is mm. a great question. I mean, I always thought that I would love to be the leprechaun for Halloween. But I don't... <laughs> I don't know how I'd pull that off. I think a, like an effects company would do it. You know who I'd love to do? If I could do anything, I would, I would, you know, speaking of people who passed on, Stan Winston and his effects company, what they were able to do with the Xenomorph from Alien. Can you imagine? That's my answer. Oh, well. Can you imagine you and I walking down Santa Monica Boulevard to that huge Halloween parade they do every yes. year? And somebody comes up, they want to get a picture with us. We open our mouth, and then yeah, the little <sighs> mouth comes out, and it's all dripping with goo. It gets gooier as the movie goes on. Yeah. It's awesome. Perry, who are you taking? I think I lean towards probably an Evil Dead Deadite. I love the look oh, of that. Yeah. And then I could just run through a whole list of creepy creatures I would want to be from Cabin in the Woods. The mm. the Sugar Plum Fairy is one of my favorite. The oh, ballerina yeah. one with like the, the teeth. And then the Dismemberment Goblins because I think they're really fun. <laughs> but then actually, so when I was like 2009, when District 9 came out, I thought I'd be so freaking cool and do a costume from District 9. And I had, I had like a t-shirt that had a human hand shaking a prawn hand. And it was, it said something like, we're together now. And I had an alien arm and I had a contact and nobody knew what I was. Right. And I was so upset. So if like someone could redeem my, uh, <laughs> my Wiccas, uh, bad Halloween costume. I would love that. That's awesome. Uh, Sinead and, and uh, uh, Wendy, I want to get your guys' take on it in a minute, but I also think that somebody's going to have to be really creative and work on the cheap and on the fly, too, because we're not going to give away spoilers, but The Walking Dead season premiere just happened. Yes. And without giving away anything, mm -hmm. there's a couple costumes you could have that'd be really freaky, but you need a lot of good effects for it, too. So, uh, Roka, do you have any other ones since I took yours? You'd have to keep an eye out for that one. Uh, mine would be Freddy Krueger. Oh, that's I good. I would absolutely love to have the good effects, to have, to have it perfectly well done because people have an inherent fear of that character. Mm -hmm. No matter if they're walking down the street or wherever in, on Halloween, they will still freak out if it's really well done and I can do the voice and do the little cracks and jokes. <laughs> you know, Come get me, B-word. All right, there we go. All right, uh, Sinead, if you could be any movie monster, you don't have to worry about budget, you don't have to worry about effects, you can look like this movie monster creature. Who are you taking? Um, I'd probably be like the girl version of Edward Scissorhands. I've Ooh. tried to do it myself one time. It didn't work out too well. It looked really ridiculous. A lot of cuts and bruises. Yeah, and like the giant well, blades. But like you'd have yeah. to you'd have to pull it off really well for it in order to be believable. But I also think um, that it would be kind of cool to dress up as a transformer because <sighs> I feel like it would be head to toe. <laughs> 
a, a costume that's like <laughs> head to toe, like you totally ha you'd have that's to right. totally commit. That's right. Like full Why don't you two just walk off into gear. the sunset together? <laughs> She's got a boyfriend. I think it'd be I really fun. I love you, Sinead. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's great. I'm not, I'm not trying to appeal to you, Roca. Yeah, well, fine, saying. but I still love you anyway. I mean, I if you want to please Roca, I'm just going to go as the Independence Day 2 Blu ray and just have people throw <laughs> eggs at me. Wow. Uh, Wendy, who would you like to be? <laughs> um, if I'm going for like the more creepy. Um, Flair, I'd want to be like the female version of Venom or Carnage. Oh, nice. Like, that would be so badass. Yeah. Or if I want to get super girly and fantastical, I want to be a mermaid. All right. Good, Good. creatures all. Let's uh, put our money together and see what we can afford. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can afford one xenomorph mouth. That's all we got. All right, let's move on to live Twitter questions. As we mentioned before, this is where you guys have tweeted us live after watching this show. Ask us anything you want, and Wendy is our gatekeeper. So, Wendy, what is up first in the first Twitter sphere? This one comes from Love Daggerborn, and they write, If Aaron Reich does a great job as Han Solo, is there any chance that he'll be cast as, next, as the next Indiana Jones? <laughs> I can't mm. imagine that they would cast Alden Ehrenreich as the next Indiana Jones, regardless of how well he does Han Solo, because I don't think it's the right move for him as an actor um, to follow in Harrison Ford's footsteps in two different franchises, although it is in intriguing. Like, if he does remind us that much of Harrison Ford, it, Han Solo and Indiana Jones are very similar characters, mm -hmm. so you could see him pulling it off well. I just don't know that he would want to do that. I think he might want to go off and blaze some of his own trails, too. Perry, do you see it differently? No, no, I don't think this is possible at all for a whole variety of reasons, just because if if that ever did happen and you know that sparked a whole new iter mm -hmm. iteration of that franchise then you have scheduling issues which mm -hmm. i imagine would be impossible to get past and it's just i brought this up on jedi council the other day i like alden aaron right quite a bit mm -hmm. i think he's going to do a great job as han solo but there's always the issue when an actor becomes very familiar and they're trying to ro to redo a role in a way that some replay a role you know what i mean that someone else did and have their star persona and what I already know of them fade to the background. So at that point, let's say he, he's just like killer as Han Solo and I love him as that. I don't even know if I'll be able to shake that and then see Indiana Jones, even though those characters were played by the same actor originally. I just want, I want it nice and clean and separate. I want to appreciate him as that one thing and let him do some other stuff like, like Hail Caesar. Don't mm -hmm. close the door to all those other great projects that he could be doing. Right, and the Han Solo movie is not going to come out until 2018, so we won't really know what the audience reaction to him as Han Solo mm -hmm. is until it's yeah. too late for Indiana Jones, yeah. which is scheduled for release in 2019, so they'll probably already have the new Indiana Jones cast by then. Would you like to see Aaron Reich do those two different roles? No, no, I mean, and as an actor who's still moonlight somewhat as an actor, I would say <laughs> the last thing you want to do is be following constantly in another famous actor's footsteps. It's a lot of pressure to put on yourself as an actor to be trying to bring back or trying to re-establish a character just because you look like them. You know, Brandon Routh almost broke under the pressure of looking at Christopher Reeve and doing Superman Returns. He went away for quite some time and, and had to kind of come back to the uh, center again. And so you see that happen. I think he's taking on enough with Han Solo. Uh, and we don't, we need to have a separation, right? There's rumors about Chris Pratt. I think we just need someone new as Indiana Jones. If you're going to reboot it, just reboot it with someone new and someone who's going to be powerful, interesting, and fun. But if you're going to, if you're going to do Alden Einreich, then it just kind of brings all this idea oh they're just there's no uh there's no real thought into it it was an easy way out rather than an inventive way to cast a new person yeah and it almost makes him less an actor and more like a human cover band yeah. which we don't need but i am looking forward to him as han so and i got more excited when i heard the news that donald glover is going to be playing lando yeah that might be the one that won me over on this concept in general all right what's our next question next one comes from goose clues who writes do you think we could get a Planet Hulk tease as a post credit scene at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy 2? I think you absolutely could because Guardians of the Galaxy 2, they're going to be going off. And James Gunn has noted that it's not really going to be an adventure that ties in too much with everything else that's going on in the MCU. But that's not to say that a post credit scene would not do that because you have the release of Guardians of the Galaxy and then that fall you are going to have Thor Ragnarok. So whether it's a Planet Hulk tease or not, I'm not sure about that, but there could be some sort of tie-in with the events of Thor Ragnarok. It makes sense to me. How about yeah. you, Roka? Yeah, I, I think it would be great. It would certainly stoke the fires of what we talked about earlier of them using this as a springboard for a, a Hulk standalone film. Mm -hmm. And Planet Hulk seems the way it's already invested. You don't need to do a, a lot of like origin story stuff. People know the story and they've established themselves with the character enough with Hulk that we don't need that prequel stuff. So just jump right into it. Let's keep it, put him on an adventure and let's have some fun. I think it'd be great. Perry, post credit scene, Guardians of the Galaxy. 
Galaxy 2. We getting Hulk stuff? Give me. I want it. I want it. There's, <laughs> I mean, really, it's Marvel's model. And they're doing a pretty damn good job with these post credit scenes. I'm so. hearing very good things about the post credit no, scenes in Doctor Strange. No spoilers here, but I was certainly happy with what I saw. And if they do tease Planet Hulk at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I have a feeling I'd be satisfied with it. All right. I think I will stay in my seat until the very end of Doctor Strange <laughs> later today. Mm -hmm. What's up next? Next comes from DJ Dex, or sorry, TJ Dex, and he writes, What film or horror character growing up petrified you as a kid to no end? Uh, I, I was never really petrified by Freddy Krueger because I always found him somewhat engaging, despite the fact he's a child murderer. He was also really funny, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're funny enough, I can forgive all the <laughs> kid murdering you did back in your day before you got burned to a crisp and killed and went to hell and now you're back in my dreams. I just thought that was such a cool concept. <laughs> Didn't really paralyze me as a kid. The one I always go back to is the movie Pet Cemetery. Mm. None of the none of the animals, none of the kids that were coming back from the dead scared me, but the sister Zelda yeah. in the flashbacks paralyzed me with fear. I couldn't first of all, I couldn't understand why do we need to see this in the movie? And I guess the reason is because you're going to remember Pet Cemetery even more because what 30 years on after seeing that movie, I am still scared to death of Zelda. I do not want my spine twisted mm. in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Perry, who scared you to the point of damn near paralysis when you were a kid? I wouldn't say that ever happened. The one that's gotten in my head the wow. most is Freddy Krueger just because, you know, you can't fall asleep. And how hard is that to stay awake? You know, mm. you're just, you're so susceptible to his abilities. I can understand that being the most petrifying one in that sense. But the only, the only villain that I can ever remember actually like having nightmares about or staying up. And this is only because I watched the movie when I was, I'm talking like four or five, and I vividly remember the friend's house I watched this movie in when yeah. I was way too young for it was, was Killer Clowns from Outer oh, Space, yeah. which I didn't even realize was a comedy until I grew up and rewatched it. But just, you know, a five-year-old watching a movie about clowns that do those kinds of things to people, it, it gets stuck in your head a little. Oh, and clowns, the scary clowns making a resurgence. You're not allowed to be a clown this Halloween. Like, there's, it's too real for people. Clowns are <laughs> Scary as hell. Roka, yeah. who scared you as a kid? Well, two things. <laughs> two, two real, real, no doubt. Like, my parents are, were, they're immigrants to this, now. They had to, to this country. They had to work all the time. So I was home being taken care of by this 70-year-old lady, Senora Lucila, who used to take care of me, right? But she would fall asleep. Yeah. And so I would get to flip on the television. And as a kid, at nine years old, I watched uh, Nosferatu, which was on. Oh, boy. Scared the living hell out of me. <laughs> to see that thing appear out of that nine foot bald vampire with the, if you haven't seen it it's a Murnau's film go and watch it it's a silent film it's fantastic they still show it and screen it special events with live orchestra doing the score it's such an incredibly powerful and painfully scary film for me whenever I see the image of I just reflect back to it and get real scared Nosferatu again Nosferatu didn't scare me because I watched that movie yeah. I, I was first introduced to it through the Are You Afraid of the Dark episode oh, and yes. that scared me that right. version of it some of yeah. Ryan Gosling's best work. Are yes. you afraid of it? It is true. The second one is if you ever saw this 70s film, back in the 70s, they did these little compilation horror films, Trilogy of Terror, mm -hmm. which is what led to Creep Show, those kinds of vibes, right? And this, there was a great little one about this. Uh, uh, I forget the lady's name, Lauren Hutton or Angela Black, one of these women who was there. Uh, she, she is being chased around by this three foot tall pygmy kind of idol that chases her all over her house with a little spear. And she tries to burn it in the oven, she tries to burn it in the microwave, and it keeps living. And then at the end, the, she finally kills it, and the spirit comes out and goes into her. And it's wicked, but that little thing scared the hell out of me. And I would hear, it's, I mean, you could hear little things in your house sometimes, you'd be like, what is that? You know, you'd freak out. And so those two things scared me as a kid. Yeah, somebody up. who's been inhabited by the spirit of pygmies, I can tell you, it's no picnic. And if you find a <laughs> pygmy in your house, you don't want to throw it in the oven. That's the wrong way to go. You don't want to microwave it because it'll explode. You want to grill it to a nice crisp. Mwah. Put some marinade on there. It's good stuff. All right, let's <laughs> do one more Twitter question and call it a week. <laughs> okay, we're staying with the scary <laughs> slash Halloween theme, and this yeah. one comes from Phil Feng Foom. What other than scaring, oh, other than scaring Makuga, <laughs> what are your favorite things to do around Halloween? Favorite traditions around Halloween, other than obviously scaring Makuga. Oh. Um, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I like getting dressed up, but my, my favorite 
thing about Halloween is all the scary movies that are on TV all over the place. I know there's some channels that just do like 24 hour marathons of scary movies and it's so it's so cool to have that on. As far as when back when I was a trick or treater mm. goes, I always thought I would be this person as an adult and I'm just I'm too lazy to do it is there's always like the house in your neighborhood mm. where that somebody would like be be just like waiting and you think it's just like a scarecrow and then all of a sudden they would come to life on the porch once the kids got up there and scared the crap out of them. I always thought I'd be that guy. Maybe it's in my future, but I haven't done it yet. I don't even think I've ever bought candy to give up. <laughs> You're I live in an apartment, so nobody, I have literally had zero trick-or-treaters. Since I moved to Los Angeles, I've had zero trick-or-treaters come by Casa Ellis. I lived in a Manhattan apartment for like a decade, and we still had a couple trick-or-treaters. Well, Manhattan kids are a little more uh, they're affable. Little they, yeah. 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 yeah, they're ready to go. You know That's what I so would do? Sad. If I was a kid in, in Los Angeles, I would have my parents drive me to Beverly Hills and I would go trick or treat at yeah. those homes. You see the Beverly Hills homes? You're getting like a king size yeah. Butterfinger. It's not like, or you know. Or shot, yeah, one of the two. Yeah, it's like, oh good, I got pencils. Oh, thanks, a toothbrush. No, you're getting good candy from yeah. Beverly Hills houses. You That's are. my recommendation. Boom. Barry, what's your favorite Halloween tradition? My Halloween tradition is a 24 hour movie marathon. And the one that I used to do all the time that sadly does not exist anymore is Fear, Fear Net I used to play uh, Trick or Treat, Mike Dougherty's Trick or Treat. Oh all day long and I wouldn't watch it for 24 hours straight but I would probably watch that movie like four or five times just on Halloween alone now sadly that channel is no longer here but I own it thankfully so I watch and rewatch as much as I possibly can another tradition that I've spoken about on nightmares is when I was living in the Manhattan apartment so like Manhattan apartments obviously there's it's not like outdoors you're confined to the hallway and I would just go and find the creepiest mask possible and I would hang it on my door to like upset the neighbors nice. and the goal was always in one year we pulled it off and I was so happy to find the creepiest mask mask that would make the neighbors need to turn it around <laughs> and one year it kept happening and I was so proud of myself but here here that's I kind of awesome. got lazy and I like went to CVS and picked up like a skeleton pumpkin and that's what's <laughs> dangling from my door now so that'll, that'll have to do the trick Roka uh, yeah. we have the weekend then Halloween is actually on Monday provided yeah. a pygmy doesn't possess you what is your favorite <laughs> Halloween tradition uh, I have we do two we, we get together at a friend's house right off the strip here in Holly in uh, down in Hollywood uh, and we get together we all dress up, take a massive picture, have drinks, food, catch up, listen to music, and then we walk the boulevard uh, out there on Santa Monica Boulevard in WeHo and see all the amazing costumes that people come up with. That is such a great tradition to me because one of the great things you enjoy is seeing the inventiveness and the creativity of people. Like people spend months creating their costumes, you know, and you see what, and they want to parade it through that boulevard. And it's just so much fun, people watching, just stand and just watch it all, you know, and, and see how people interact. And people are in such a great mood that they interact with each other and they give each other respect for the costumes. That's always such a fun time and, and I enjoy do, doing that all the time. And the second thing is going to the El Capitan and seeing Nightmare mm -hmm. Before Christmas. It's yes. always great sitting in the balcony, front row, and seeing a screening of that with popcorn and just having a good time and enjoying that. I uh, might be ushering in a new tradition uh, because tonight I'm going to go see Danny Elfman at Hollywood Bowl. Me nice. And, uh, me and the lady are going to go see it. He's doing Nightmare Before Christmas and I'm hoping he can encore the 1989 Batman be awesome. Mm. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. How did we not talk about who? pet costumes? Is Molly dressing up? Uh, Molly is dressing up. I can't give away what her costume okay. is. No, but I'm not giving away duties either. Molly are all going to okay. be something themed from oh. a certain television program. Oh, no. I don't know if I can compete with that. It's <laughs> I, and Nobody can, but, you know, it's so cool to see all these different Halloween traditions. Uh, ladies over there at the other table, Sinead, Wendy, do you guys have any Halloween traditions that you'd like to share with the entire world? I mean, growing up, it was all about trick-or-treating. Like, every single year was the greatest, greatest day of of the entire year was trick or treating. Um, but now it's more like just getting your costume and going out. Like it's become pretty lame. <laughs> I guess like Harrison, once he's old enough, I'll be able to relive my trick or treating days with him. But I mean, he's like, what, 10 months old? He doesn't understand what today is or what Monday is at all. So it's kind of a bummer. I was thinking about dressing him up as a donut hole, though, and just <laughs> taking, yes. taking pictures. But that's about it. I, I'm like more excited about him growing up so I could relive like when I was so stupid stoked to go out and trick-or-treat. Just knowing your history with donut holes, it might be dangerous for us to you to go dress your kid up as a donut hole because he might be a little in danger. Um, Wendy, do you have any great Halloween traditions? Well, growing up in Taiwan, Halloween doesn't exist in Taiwan, so when I came to the States uh. and I was like, free candy from strangers? and it's approved, I'll take it, but now I'm too old to go trick or treat. So um, I kind of fall back to more of the scarier haunts like Halloween Horror Nights, Knots, Alley Haunted Hayride, and I kind of miss 
be one of the characters at Horror mm. Nights, to be honest with you. I miss scaring people. That's right. Well, we want to hear from you guys. Comment right now. Let us know what your Halloween tradition is for Wendy. It is doing like a haunted hayride for Sinead. It's dressing her kid up as something. Perry, she loves watching the movies. I love not giving kids candy. And Roca has a costume sex orgy. So, what? Now oh, it is up know. to you guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Collider <laughs> Movie Talk on this pre Halloween edition. I want to thank everybody, both behind the scenes and up front here, for joining me today. Where where can the kids find you, Perry? You can find me not hanging out with Roca on Halloween <laughs> and also on Twitter and Instagram at PNamorov Collider Nightmares. Every Tuesday, best of the week, every Saturday. Happy Halloween, guys. And he's going to dress up in Revolutionary War garb and make out with a bunch of people. He is John <laughs> Roca. Where can the kids find you this weekend? <laughs> I like the way you churn butter. No, uh, hi. This is how you can find me at the Roca says always on Twitter and Instagram. And actually, this Halloween night, you can find me at Universal Studios at The Walking Dead. Ooh. So if you're gonna go, you just might see me there messing around, being one of the saviors, talking to you to get your butt in that maze. Uh, yeah, guys, always follow uh, the Cinephiles, which is on iTunes. We just dropped a, a brand new episode this morning. We did Die Hard, so please uh, download it and listen to it. And of course, Super Animation Game Time, 1 p.m. every Wednesday over there at Geek and Sundry on their Twitch channel. We just interviewed Dwight Schultz, Lieutenant Barclay from yeah. Next Generation, and Howling Mad Murdock from the A Team. He was so awesome. So those are the shows going on right now. And Die Hard. One of the great holiday movies of all time. Sinead DeFries, where can the kids find you? I'll be hanging out on Mailbag this weekend. And then on Monday for TV Talk, we're going to be dressing up as each other on TV Talk. So that should be a oh, lot of fun. Yes. And then next Friday, back for Movie Talk. You can find me online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. Wendy Lee Zaney. You can find me at Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. My name is merely Mark Ellis. You guys can follow me on all the social media networks at Mark Ellis Live, where I will be posting my Doctor Strange emoji on Instagram at some point later today, probably around the 4.30 hour. Keep an eye out for that. And of course, the panels this weekend at Stan Lee's Los Angeles Comic Con. For everybody here, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we'll see you guys next time on Collider Movie Talk. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.